Welcome to another episode of Auto Mundial, where this week we're taking a look at the hottest EV of the moment, the Porsche Taycan. And we have the latest hot hatch from Mercedes and a pair of BMW concept cars. All that is still to come, but first... Jaguar Land Rover is deploying more than 160 vehicles globally for use by emergency response teams tackling the COVID-19 pandemic, including the all-new Defender. This includes the British Red Cross, which has taken delivery of 57 brand new SUVs for delivering food and medicine to the elderly and vulnerable. But it's not just vehicles they're providing. Like many other British manufacturers, JLR is working closely with the UK government, offering digital engineering know-how and designs, including 3D modeling, machine learning and AI, to assist the National Health Service. A relationship which dates back to the mid-1950s, the British mark continues its legacy of assisting the government and charities all over the world. It's no secret that we're big fans of hot hatches here at Auto Mundial, and this could well be the hottest of them all, the all-new Mercedes-AMG A45. There are two versions available, the regular 382 brake horsepower A45 and the monstrous 415 brake horsepower A45S. Needless to say, that's the one we'll be concentrating on here. Both versions make use of the same engine, a highly strung turbocharged 2.0-litre, sending power to all four wheels via an 8-speed dual-clutch automatic. 0-62 to miles per hour is taken care of in a barely believable 3. 9 seconds. 3.9, that's quicker than an AMG GT. Naturally, the A45 gets some proper stopping power too, with some four-pot front brakes or some hefty six-pots on the S version. Adaptive dampers come as standard, as does the all-important adaptive exhaust, which sounds suitably naughty. Top speed is limited to 155 miles per hour, as per most German cars, but an optional driver's package can be specified, which removes the electronic limiter, allowing the littlest AMG to reach 168. This being an AMG product, the A45 is always going to be powerful, but the boffins at Afal Tobacco have been busy working on the chassis too. Too. While the Tamer A35 served as a base, the full fat 45 gets some frequency selective shock absorbers and something very exciting that we first saw on the Ford Focus RS a drift mode. Oh yes, this is a very sideways hot hatch. At the press of a button, the grippy all-wheel drive A45 is transformed into a tyre shredding hooligan. The very clever rear differential is fitted with two multi-disc clutches that can send different amounts of power to each wheel. There are six other driving modes, including one configurable individual mode, as well as four different settings for the traction control. Differentiate the A45 from the lesser A35, some more aggressive aero and styling upgrades are fitted. There's a deeper front splitter, some very sporty canards and that enormous rear wing. The interior is largely the same as in the A35, meaning you get the wonderful M-Bucks dual screen infotainment system, some bucket seats, a flat bottom steering wheel and countless AMG badges around the cabin. The most noticeable difference is the new optional yellow trim taking the place of the red trim in the regular car. Everything else inside is standard A-Class, meaning decent space throughout, a decent boot and some nice haptic controls. The new A45 then has jumped straight to the top of its class, but its key rival, the Audi RS3, has its own charms. Climb aboard the RS3 and you get the sense that the whole car was really built to last. The build quality in the Mercedes is excellent, but the Audi is on another level. The materials are beautiful too, with swathes of Alcantara and carbon fibre throughout. And then there's the RS3's party piece, its engine. No puny four-cylinder here, oh no, 
the Audi gets a glorious turbocharged 2.5-litre five-cylinder motor, pumping out a respectable 395 brake horsepower. Like the Mercedes, the Audi is all-wheel drive, allowing for a 0-62 time of 4.1 seconds. Marginally slower than the AMG, but top speed is higher at 174 miles per hour. Useful if your commute takes you via Germany. The styling is much more subtle, in keeping with Audi's classy, more refined character. Open the taps though and the RS3 howls through its tailpipes. It really is one of the greatest sounding engines in production right now. So is the Audi good enough to tempt buyers away from the riotous new Mercedes? Well, it's an older car that's due to be replaced very soon, but one that's proven to be very popular. However, get out on a twisty road and really push it, and the Audi just doesn't quite feel sharp enough to satisfy the most discerning of drivers. The crackles and bangs from the exhaust are addictive, but it lacks the lightweight feel and dynamics of its rivals. The new Mercedes AMG A45, then, is the current hot hatch king, and one that we suspect will be holding on to its crown for some time. Buyers looking for a large premium SUV these days have plenty of choices from all the usual suspects. Audi has the Q7, Mercedes has the GLE and Volvo has the XC90. And while each of these is now available with some form of hybridization, the original hybrid SUV offers something a little different. Way back in 2004, the old Lexus RX cemented the brand's reputation for building desirable hybrids, and the latest one is no different. Standing apart from its European competition with its bold Japanese styling, the big Lexus continues to do things in its own way. Recently refreshed for 2020, the RX features a toned-down take on the rest of the Lexus lineup's striking design language. It still makes a bold first impression, though, with a huge front grille and high waistline. It's a nice change from a lot of the copy-and-paste SUV styling we've seen lately, and that continues inside. It may not look as high-tech as some of its rivals, but everything you touch exudes quality. Lexus is bucking the trend in the cabin with fewer touchscreen controls and a lot more buttons, all of which produce some seriously satisfying clicks as you push them. This smorgasbord of buttons will appeal to some, but those used to more minimalist cockpits may prefer to shop elsewhere. There is only one screen on show, a 12.3-inch touchscreen sitting atop the dash, with traditional dials remaining in place, rather than an increasingly common digital replacement. Unfortunately, as is the case with the rest of the Lexus and Toyota range, the infotainment leaves a lot to be desired. It isn't anywhere near as slick as the systems available in its German rivals, but it does come with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, allowing you to pretty much bypass the standard software. It's available either as a five-seater or a seven-seater if you opt for the slightly longer RXL, but both versions offer excellent cabin space. Powering the big Lexus is a big 3.5-litre V6, coupled up to a traditional full hybrid system, producing a total output of 308 brake horsepower. 0 to 62 miles per hour takes 7.7 .7 seconds on its way up to a top speed of 124, although the CVT gearbox can become drony if you work it hard. On the motorway, though, the RX settles down to become a wonderfully quiet cruiser, but it's just as happy around town, making full use of the tried and tested hybrid system. However, if you're after a large SUV that's quiet around town, you might be better off with a plug-in hybrid, a car that allows you to run on electric only for short distances. One such car is this, the Audi Q7 TFSi e, with an electric range of 26 miles. That may not seem like a lot, but it should be plenty for most urban commutes. 
Like the Lexus, the Audi styling is centred around a huge front grille, but looking back from there, it certainly doesn't have the charismatic design of the RX. Inside, though, it's every bit as up-to-date as you could want. Full of sharp angles and glossy materials, it feels much more modern than the Lexus. It also offers one of the best infotainment systems on the market, with bright, crisp graphics and logical menus. It uses three screens, one for media, one for climate control, and a digital cockpit sat behind the steering wheel. Like the Lexus, the Q7 is available with seven seats, although the third row is definitely best suited to small children. Out on the road, the heavyweight Audi rides superbly on its air suspension, and its relatively sharp handling makes it a lot more driver-focused than most big SUVs. There are various driving modes on offer, as well as the optional four-wheel steering system that helps improve stability and manoeuvrability. It seems then that the European choices still offer the best overall package, but the Lexus looks great and has a character of its own. It doesn't feel quite as modern as the competition though, and with more and more manufacturers now offering plug-in hybrids, it seems that the RX needs to catch up. After the break, the Porsche take. Coming up, Porsche's Tesla rival. But first... In recent episodes, we've been looking back at some of the quirkiest concept cars of the past 10 years and with some of the wackiest creations from around the automotive world. This week, we're taking a look at a pair of BMW concepts that dared to do things a bit differently. We've long been critical about BMW's current fascination with huge front grilles. The X5, X7, new Z4 and 7 Series all seem to be styled with a convex mirror. But last year, BMW went one step further with this, the Concept 4. Presumably designed to hoover up as much wildlife as possible, it features the biggest pair of nostrils of any BMW to date. But for the purposes of this feature, we must try and look past the gaping vertical black holes at the front of this car and delve into what could be the new 4 Series. Unveiled at last year's Frankfurt Motor Show, the Concept 4 is said to be 85% production ready. And that's a worry, as to us at least, the styling seems to be a bit of a hodgepodge. The shape takes influences from various historic BMWs, including the 3.0-litre CSI and 328 Coupe. It's got some clear 8-series styling at the rear, but seems to share little with the current 3-series on which the new 4 will be based. However, BMW says this is just a glimpse of what the new 4-series range will look like. We expect there'll be a four-door Grand Tourer version, as well as a convertible and, of course, an M model. It's clear, though, that BMW is aiming to distance the four from the current 3 Series lineup. The twin headlight setup is different from anything we've seen from the German brand, with narrow LEDs cut into the bodywork without any conventional lens cover. The front end aside though, this is an attractive coupe shape with a long bonnet, low roof line and short rear end. This being a concept car, it of course gets a gorgeous set of enormous alloy wheels, 21 inches to be precise. Towards the back, the sharp fibre optic tail lights are reminiscent of current production versions with an L-shaped design borrowed from elsewhere in BMW's lineup. As per the outgoing model, we expect the new 4 Series to use the same range of powertrains as the 3, meaning a tasty selection of 4 and 6 cylinder engine options with a plug-in hybrid variant and, perhaps, even a full EV in the pipeline. But this isn't the only coupe concept BMW built last year. This is the BMW Garmisch. And while it looks like it came straight off a 1970s motor show stand, it was completed in 2019. 
penned by the legendary car designer Marcello Gandini, the Garmiche isn't actually a brand new car. First unveiled at the 1970 Geneva Motor Show, the original car was lost shortly after the show had finished. And before you ask, no, we don't know how you lose a concept car either, especially one as breathtakingly gorgeous as this. But while the original went on to influence BMW design throughout the decade, this stunning recreation was built solely for the prestigious Concorso d'Eleganza via Deste, just about the world's poshest car show. Inside the glorious greenhouse, the cabin is just as wacky as the exterior. There's endless space inside, with a strange vertically mounted radio and an enormous vanity mirror for the passenger. It's an undoubtedly awesome project, but it's even more incredible when you discover the car was recreated using only black and white images of the original. The latest 3D modeling tech was used, and Gandini himself was on hand to help fabricate the interior from memory. It was even built in Turin, just like the original. In our eyes, this will always be cooler than the new Concept 4. It even proves that you can have a bold front grille that actually looks good. While the current lockdown measures around the world right now may mean that we're seeing fewer new releases this year than we normally would, there are still some cars released in the past 12 months that remain talking points among car fans everywhere. And perhaps the most talked about car of the year is this, the Porsche Taycan. While electric cars have been with us for a while now, few have really felt like true sports cars. Sure, there are plenty of fast EVs out there that will pin you to the back of your seat, but generally speaking, the weight of all those batteries has meant they never really feel quite as impressive in the corners. And this is what Porsche is aiming to address with the Taycan. But can this electric saloon really rewrite the EV rulebook? Well, on the face of it, the Taycan doesn't seem like anything too out of the ordinary. The range is limited to about 280 miles if you drive it carefully, and it still takes plenty of time to reach a full charge. And as Tesla fans will point out at any given opportunity, it isn't as fast as a Model S P100D in a straight line. But while numbers look good on paper, Porsche isn't simply aiming for outright pace with the Taycan. When development began back in 2014, the 911 was set as the benchmark for driving feel and performance. No mean feat for an electric saloon car. So has the world's most preeminent sports car maker succeeded in making a proper driver's EV. Well, there are two versions available, the entry-level Turbo and the top-spec Turbo S. Glossing over the rather misleading nomenclature, both cars get the same 93.4 kilowatt hour lithium ion batteries mounted to a so-called skateboard chassis between the two axles, each with its own motor. Both models get four-wheel steering, Panamera-based suspension and a two-speed gearbox to maximise grunt off the line. All this equates to 616 brake horsepower for both versions and a 0 to 62 mile per hour time of 3.2 seconds. Both cars also get an overboost function which gets the turbo up to 671 brake horsepower during launch control, while the Turbo S goes all the way up to 750 brake horsepower thanks to its larger front inverter. That means the S can get to 62 in just 2.8 seconds. OK, the Tesla is marginally quicker, but the Porsche isn't exactly a slouch. Also exclusive to the Turbo S are the carbon ceramic brake discs and some wider wheels and tyres. The only subtle giveaway is that you're driving the daddy of all EVs. Step inside the futuristic cabin with its beautiful screens and body-hugging seats and you immediately know you're in something a bit special. Flick the 911-derived toggle switch into drive and you notice a distant hum. It all feels quite exciting, like you're in a spaceship, and then you put your foot down and enter warp speed. The gentle hum becomes a sci-fi whoosh as your internal organs are forced towards the back of the seat. The off-the-line speed is astounding. Unlike a petrol-powered car, there's no drop-off in torque, just constant acceleration in one big linear lump. 
And unlike a Tesla, it'll do it all day, every day, with no need to preheat the batteries or give the car any warning. But we know EVs are quick, and what really matters is how it drives. After all, this is a Porsche. Well, thankfully, the Taycan has been engineered to handle just like a sports car. The steering is sharp and responsive with just enough feel to let you know what the wheels are doing. It's not as involving as a 911, but it doesn't feel all that artificial. In everything but Sport Plus mode, the air suspension is supple whilst eliminating any sign of body roll at road speeds. It does still feel heavy, but the low centre of gravity means it never feels compromised. It has all the grip that you could ever want and the brakes do a great job of stopping the 2.3 tonne heavyweight. You may soon start to miss pulling paddles or shifting a gear stick but apart from that this really is a proper Porsche. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we check out some performance SUVs from BMW.